My name is Jason Woods. I am um, with uh, Local 36 in Washington, D.C. I'm also the president of our Firefighters Burn Center Foundation and the 4th District Burn Coordinator rep for the IFF Burn Foundation. The program we're here to talk to you guys about today is a program that started in D.C. back in 2008 um, addressing firefighter burn injuries. Jan's going to go into a little bit of the details and the history on the program. Uh, through the Assistance to Firefighters program now, this has turned into a national program that we've been doing around the country. We have our next Train the Trainer coming up uh, in Nashville in um, November 1st. So, start you off with a little brief video here. Again, this is funded by the uh, FEMA Prevention and Safety Grants. I'm going to start the video. Before I do that, I'll go ahead and introduce our first presenter. Um, his name is Jan Sipes. Jan's a 13-year veteran of the District of Columbia Fire Department, member of Local 36. Um, he's the chair of our safety committee, uh, one of our instructors for the program, and he's also a member of our family services team for when we have firefighters in the burn unit. They choose to do this, and they know that what they're doing is, is potentially going to save lives and, and protect others. The date was November 7, 2002, a year after 9-11. About 2.45 this afternoon, flames from a mattress fire that began in the basement of this St. Albans home became so intense they burned through the ceiling causing a bookcase to topple on firefighters responding on the first floor. I got up, started running, tripped, fell, lost my helmet. I got up again, tripped and fell again, hit something else. Third time I got up, or fourth time, I'm not sure, I must have hit an entertainment center and it fell on top of me. And at Halliday sustained second and third degree burns over 40% of it's his body, including the top of his head and hands. Now my face piece is burning off. The straps that hold it are melting or burning. I was conscious the whole time, and uh, I was angry. I was more angry than anything else that this happened. I couldn't believe that I'm 10 feet from a door, and I'm going to die. The fire where I got injured, I didn't have my chin strap snapped. And I, on a regular basis, I didn't have my chin strap on. And it was just something that I had grown up with through the years doing. Was it right? No, it was wrong. When my helmet came off in that fire, it was ugly. A fatal midnight fire at this townhouse on Cherry Road. Something terribly wrong happened. Firefighters dropped one by one. There's no way to describe where I have come from to where I am now. Came much later to find out how how close I was to not surviving that night. Um, I was given a 5% chance to live. I saw a flash of flame come through a doorway, and uh, the next thing I know, total blackness and heat that was unbearable. Safety is, is key. Uh, one of the things that I share is that um, on this particular fire, I had all of my gear on correctly except for the ear flaps on my helmet. And with all of that, I still received second and third degree burns over 60 plus percent of my body. And this was just from the heat. You have a chance if you have the gear. If you don't wear the gear, your chances are less likely of survival. Okay, that's just a, a brief video. The actual video for the program is about 30 minutes. Uh, it's a two and a half hour program, so obviously today we don't have time to go through it, so we're just going to give you a brief overview of the program. So here is Jan. Everybody hear me? Good morning. Uh, like Jason said, a couple years ago, uh, we started having an issue or we started seeing a trend uh, or a spike in our burn injuries amongst our guys. Uh, we, you know, we're very fortunate to have the uh, trauma center located in the city. We have a phenomenal burn unit there in the city. 
Over the years, we've had our share of burn injuries, uh, but what we were seeing at the time was uh, it was a spike or it started trending upwards with uh, a lot of guys coming uh, from the job into the burn unit uh, and had been burned. Um, for those of you who don't know, District of Columbia, approximately 68.3 square miles. Uh, populations uh, has changed, certainly. Uh, 630 was a nice number, but we're having about 1,000 people a month are moving into the city. Uh, so there's always a big scramble to find, uh, find affordable housing for them. Uh, definitely is increasing our run volume significantly. Um, our typical box alarm response in the city, be it either a two-story row or uh, some of the massive apartment buildings we have is going to be five engines, two trucks, a squad, two chiefs on the initial with battalion aides. Uh, and if it's confirmed work and fire, they're automatically going to hit the work and fire dispatch, which brings us additional engine company, truck, and a safety officer. So for the initial dispatch, we're getting 37 firemen. Uh, some would almost, uh, I would th say it's an, uh, an adequate response. It could certainly be a lot better. I know that we're better than... Uh, a lot of the jurisdictions around us, we're very fortunate to have that. Uh, we all should know, hopefully, the risk, the risk of our job. I don't think this gets emphasized enough sometimes. You really only have to go so far as to open up the coat on your turnout gear to realize that firefighting is inherently dangerous. This should be a no-brainer, but I think that sometimes we don't pay as much attention to that or we don't reinforce that as much as it should be. Uh, being a fully encapsulated firefighting force you know, great advancements over the last 20, 25 years with SCBA technology, that personal protective technology, of course, is, uh, is the best we've ever had it. Uh, but what we've seen in doing some of the research is gear's top notch, SCBAs are top notch, bad result of that. Uh, we're putting ourselves now in places where we shouldn't be, uh, going deeper than we should. Uh, so as fires are, are on the downward trend, the burn injuries have not declined at all. They've actually remained constant, uh, which is certainly not a good thing. Uh, we, we attribute primarily just to the level of protection that we, uh, we're all dealing with right now. Uh, but like I touched on earlier, you're experiencing this unusual spike. Not really sure what was going on. Uh, you know, we were concerned, certainly. Uh, was it an SOG issue or an SOG-driven department? Uh, you know, is that something that had to be revitalized, updated, changed, modified? Was it an assignment issue? Uh, was it a training issue for us from our company officers, maybe being in the wrong place, <coughs> excuse me, at the wrong time? Uh, fortunately, though, uh, we were able to uh, get a burn committee off the ground to review the incidents. Probably the, the biggest thing and the most beneficial thing that came out of all of this was the burn committee. Uh, we were able to conduct interviews with the members, and they were non-punitive. Uh, has anybody ever been involved with a safety investigation or a, and even a line of duty death investigation with your departments? Um, a lot of times when those are conducted, there's hurt feelings at the end, especially when you're uh, calling attention to uh, the small mistakes that occurred that actually have snowballed into the larger incident itself as that unfolds. But by having this uh, non-punitive in uh, interview process in place, you can actually sit down with the members. It's very informal. I just want to understand what were you doing. You know, is it a gear issue? Um, and, and again, is it a tactics issue? Is it a training issue? Being able to do that is great versus, you know, the fear or threat of charges. Members will clam up. They're not going to come to you. You're not going to get that uh, information that you need to be able to identify the problem. So we had our time for change. We wanted to be able to uh, put out some good information when we were done, of course, re-educate the department if it was a problem, uh, ensuring that all our burns were treated properly. This wasn't always the case. Uh, we certainly had an issue uh, in years past where members were burned, I had uh, played it off as defective skin, relatively minor burns. They would go back. We had several that should have been treated and uh, would have been uh, relatively minor burns at that point. Uh, but guys decided not to go to the burn unit, go on vacation. The burn's infected. Now they're looking at a graft. Uh, probably the, uh, the more prevalent issue we were seeing was uh, burns to the ear. Ears get a little pinked up, wasn't really a big deal, feels like a sunburn, but the problem for us was we're going back to work in a couple of tours. Go to another fire that next day, now that initial uh, uh, second or, or first degree burn is that much worse. That much harder to fix, bigger problem for us. Uh, it's hard to be a fireman without any ears. So it definitely creates a problem for us. And that education piece is very important. 
very important to get that out there to the guys. Very important to, uh, to get your influential members involved with the program as well when the information is provided. So our initial partnerships with this burn committee, of course at the time it was the DCFD administration, uh, Local 36 Safety Committee was involved, uh, the Burn Foundation and the Burn Center at the Washington Hospital Center. Uh, our safety committee is pretty unique in that uh, I'm sure in a lot of organizations and a lot of places there's just, we're always doing more with less. Our risk management division for our fire department uh, consists of the uh, deputy fire chief, four captains, and we have an infectious control officer for uh, 2,000 personnel. Certainly not enough. Again, it's better than just having that one captain there, but the four captains are on shift work, so they're also responsible for, um, they're also responsible for shift work as the uh, safety officer responding to any and all incidents in the city where they're required. So extremely hard for them to get a lot of work done during the day, and that's where we as a safety committee can step up and uh, insist, assist them with anything that uh, they're having issues with or uh, we feel are becoming issues as well. Some of the things we found certainly uh, was training versus a real world application. Um, I know that a lot of times departments are forced to go with a canned fire department presentation. If they can't go through the IFSAC accreditation to get their own uh, books and techniques and strategies uh, approved, uh, they end up stuck with uh, using Delmar, IFSTA, uh, those, are, uh, those uh, I guess, teaching platforms, if you will. And what we've seen with even our instructor cadre, uh, our training staff is very transitional. What we'll usually have is an instructor will be detailed down for a class, so he's maybe there for six to eight months, and he's back out in the field. Creates a lot of problems for us because we don't have that consistency, we don't have the, uh, the job knowledge that's passed along, or uh, even the efficient uh, operation of how these classes have gone. So when the next guy comes in, we struggle with being able to pass along, here is everything that worked for me, here are the processes I tried, uh, this is where we are going with our training, um, this is how we want to maximize our practical application in our lectures. Uh, so that training versus real world application was critical. What we ended up finding was it had been a training issue that had come through the training academy. Uh, our linemen was where the primary burns were coming from, were sitting right in that doorway. They were sitting right in that horizontal chimney. They weren't making a push in after the environment was cooled. They weren't standing out in the hallway before they started applying. It was almost dead smack right in the doorway. And that's something we pulled from those informal discussions with those members. Uh, that was the common ground. So we certainly went back, uh, changed our practice at the time at the training academy to be able to address that. Uh, the PPE issues. Uh, we had PPE issues certainly with uh, members not wearing it appropriately. Uh, chin straps is a big issue. Uh, usually it's on the back of the helmet. Uh, I, don't, I don't really understand that. I mean, it's there for a reason. Uh, in the video, certainly, when you, uh, when you listen to Steve, and his injuries were fairly severe. If he had kept his helmet in place, he would have had that additional layer of protection. He would have been taking that, uh, that thermal heat on top of his head with only the protection of his, his hood. So, you know, having that helmet in place is critical. Plus, helmets getting knocked off, we all know, it's a stress level. You're searching around to find it. You're not paying attention to the job at hand, especially if you're the one stretching the line. You're not paying attention to conditions if you're constantly searching around looking for that helmet. Uh, lack of understanding of the modern fire environment. That is something that we are still struggling with as far as the best ways to implement that to our members. Uh, I was recently assigned to the training academy and uh, we started over our in-service training practices again. Uh, we'd reached out to a couple of local departments that were having some success with uh, the, their delivery model. And uh, we recognized that we had to change what we were doing. We looked more at uh, in-service videos that could be watched in the firehouse. So their contact time coming down in the training academy uh, was certainly more use useful to them, more beneficial to them. And we could have our instructors more closely monitor what our members were doing. Uh, in the burn unit, I'm sorry, in the burn building. Um, and that was, that was a critical thing for us because we were surprised at, I guess, the lack of proficiency even in a back to basics uh, scenario. It's, I often struggle with that because it's really, it's just training. But that's kind of a big buzzword right now. It's, uh, it's uh, a lot of guys are out there are going back to basics. And it's things that you know, we should be doing on a regardless anyway. We should be proficient in all this stuff. So it's, you know, minor reviews actually end up becoming a full-blown drill for the day because we're missing out on these basic skills. Uh, 
from the training environment, it probably gets through that day. Well, unfortunately, when we see it back out on the street, companies aren't in position, lines don't get in place adequately, ladders aren't going up where they need to be. Uh, go to a couple fires, small mistakes, people notice them, they observe them, they don't get corrected. But then when we have that final incident where that chain is finally broken, somebody ends up with a serious injury or somebody ends up being killed. And uh, of course, one of the last things we found was a too tough mentality. We're all firemen by nature, high testosterone. Um, I get it. I get it. It's, it's that company officer not paying attention to his lineman telling him that I'm hot. I'm getting too hot right now. And we even observed that as a perception too, was well, he's ahead of you. you know, that's something everybody for us had to recognize was he is the tip of the spear. On that search team, on that line, pushing in. They are the tip of the spear. They're getting the brunt. They are covering uh, most likely a majority of the heat that's coming at you. And instead of, uh, instead of our senior officers, quiet down, real, keep on going, make that push, they had to, had to almost uh, think about it a different way. It's like, look, we've got to pay attention to these guys. These guys I'm telling you that they're, uh, they're, they're getting hot doesn't mean that they're not tough. doesn't mean that they want to go put this fire out. There's a reason for it. Either we're not applying the water in the appropriate place, or we need to reevaluate where we're sitting right now. Uh, our common firefighter burn injuries, of course, if you're not already aware, uh, usually wrists and hands. Uh, that's usually the gloves, interface issues. Your gloves are way too tight, or if you don't have that second pair of gloves, your gloves are wet. That's usually pretty bad. Anybody been at home and you've got the, uh, the hot pot on the stove, you're grabbing with a uh, wet towel, or you're grabbing with the wet pot holder, certainly that water, that steam is going to conduct that a lot faster than having that dry garment. Same is true with the gloves, having a dry pair of gloves, having an additional pair of gloves, uh, it's key. The ears, we were seeing a big issue with ears, interface issues. Most of the helmets that would go out to be cleaned, uh, when they got to the uh, third party uh, provider to be able to clean the helmets, they just unrolled the ear flaps. Everything was smoke stained around the sides, and it was a brand new ear flap underneath. Uh, it was a consistent problem for us, a consistent issue. Uh, so much so that uh, in discussions with Globe, uh, we had some members that were concerned about the reduction in the coat collar length uh, under the latest standard for uh, 1971. And come to find out, and Pat Freeman explained it pretty well, well, if, if you go back and look at the majority of these helmets on a lot of these guys and a lot of the firemen out there, they're never dropping their ear flaps. They're never rolling them down. So hopefully with that shorter coat collar length, we get a better interface issue. Guys would drop those helmet uh, ear flaps back down uh, to better protect themselves. Uh, knees and lower legs. Uh, that's usually in that compression position, either doing that search, uh, making that move down that hallway. Uh, we had some members that had issues. Uh, they were wearing the Schmedium pants. Or with some time on the job, uh, they were still wearing the same size or attempting to wear the same size uh, that they initially came off with. Uh, usually when you're putting on your PPE and your bunker pants, if every time you move you hear the Velcro, Velcro is screaming and stretching, that's not a good issue. It's not a good thing for us. Uh, we had had some members that uh, just had difficulty buck, uh, buckling their pants up. And it was certainly going to be an issue for them anytime there are any type of squatting positions, uh, rotating issues, because it was compressing that right over their legs. And of course, last, shoulder issues, wearing that SCBA strap, uh, wearing Scott air packs. Uh, it's a great air pack, but it also allows to not have that waist belt buckled. Uh, again, that's, a, that's merely a training issue. That's an enforcement issue for the officers, safety officers on the fire ground. We're able to buckle that waist strap, redistribute the weight appropriately. You know, the end result is we're going to reduce or even eliminate our burns to the shoulder area. Some of the common firefighter quotes that we were able to pull off of this, you know, we got real hot real quick. Uh, didn't even feel myself getting burned. Never thought it would happen to me. I didn't think it was that bad. I think we can all attribute this really to the lack of understanding of that modern fire environment. Uh, most departments now have certainly uh, probably maybe a majority of the members have been on 20 plus years. Uh, we we're fast approaching a, uh, a major turnover in our fire department. We had a big push in the 80s, and a lot of our guys are just waiting for their age to be able to go out and retire. So our department's going to become very young, very inexperienced, not a lot of fire duty under their belt, uh, and this, uh, this is certainly going to be an issue for us if we can't push that out there appropriately. 
with this burn education awareness, how to prevent it, how to recognize the conditions in the fire building, and uh, you know, being able to stay out of the burn unit. The only time we want our guys in the burn unit certainly is when we're actually helping out or doing fundraisers. Uh, and like I touched on earlier, our, our injuries were primarily to our nozzlemen operating the line in the doorway. They weren't keeping the line open until all visible fires knocked down. That uh, is uh, directly attributed to that training mentality. Um, if you have a Class A burn building and you're lighting the pallets, what we've had problems with in the past certainly was the instructors are already taking a beating throughout the day because they're lighting the fires for the students. You're trying to maximize contact time for the recruits coming through so they could give as much time as they could stretching lines in the building. We could be evaluating them, and they're actually putting out uh, live fires. The issue for that was after a couple seconds of application, usually the instructor would tap the student on the head. That's it. That's it. We don't want to put this fire all the way out. You know, we don't want because we have to restack it. We have to remake it. The room's already too hot for us, so we don't want to have to uh, do continuous work for us. What we were seeing was that was immediately translating out on the field. That was becoming like a muscle memory thing. If that officer wasn't right behind them and giving them a nice, uh, calm, comforting words of encouragement as they're extinguishing this fire, it was a quick burst, open close, thinking the fire's knocked down, thinking it's out. Last couple of lectures, certainly the other day, we're, we're recognizing that you know, it's just as dangerous not to see fire as it is to have fire present. And uh, that issue for us was uh, something we addressed with the last in-service training program, which we've, we hope that is, uh, we'll see the, the, the reward or the, uh, the dividends out of that later on on the street. And of course, the limited means of egress. Depending upon where you're going in that occupancy, generally the, the largest opening you have is the door that you came through. So if we're not inside or outside in the hallway when we start making that a push and we're sitting right in the doorway, it's coming right through us. All the exhaust is coming right for us. And that's something we want to try to avoid with our members uh, and, and really the firefighters in general out there. What we try to enforce through the presentation too is uh, know our nozzle, know your pipe, whatever you're calling it in your jurisdiction or your area. Uh, you know, it's a tool, it's our weapon. We're not fortunate to have rifles like the military does, but uh, you know, we need to make sure we know this equipment. We have to reinforce and stress with these guys, checking this out on the street uh, you know, when you're assuming duty, should be a part of the daily check. Break it down. Check for the rocks. If you have breakaways, make sure you're opening them up. Make sure you can adjust the pattern appropriately. This should be, this should be instantaneous things. Where if we call for a pattern change or you have to change the patterns, you should be able to recognize it instantly and not have to, have to think for two, uh, one or two seconds to be able to get it going. Um, our nozzle of choice is the Akron Assault. It's a break apart. We have a 7 8 inch slug. If our, if our pattern is turned too far to the right, it actually turns it off. Uh, the reason we had that was so we had the ability to be able to extend our lines, uh, if necessary, with the hand lines. What we were also seeing from a training issue was they'd had that nozzle either closed or their pattern was set, they'd drag into the building, drag into the burn building, maybe the pipe dragged along the floor, shut it off, they go to open it, and it was like this moment of of not, not, not so much panic, but just disbelief that I don't understand. There's water here. I can feel it in the line. The bale is fully open. Oh, there must be a kink. And the realization is not there. Well, it's off. Go back. Check it out. The, the stream setting for the application. We try to reinforce that. Make sure that that's do being done on a regular basis. Uh, when we're training, we're out there drilling, we got to certainly get out of the, the, the parking lot line pull. We're running the line off the back of the engine, run it in a straight direction, the wagon driver charges the line and we stand up and we flow and go through our patterns. It's not practical. It's, we know that. It doesn't work that way. We should be dragging the line as we're going to flow through that building, actually opening it and move through. So everybody or our, our firefighters are accustomed to that operation. It's critical for us. Of course, choose the proper line selection for the job. You know, there's always the adage, uh, you know, the fire conditions should dictate the line size. If your crews aren't capable of pulling that, that two and a half or that larger line, though, that's gonna be have to, that's gonna have to be a reevaluation thing. The department's gonna have to talk about that. What are we gonna do? Are we waiting for the additional staffing to get there before we can deploy it? Or are we gonna try to focus on managing this line with uh, the, uh, the minimum staffing that we have? 
Uh, and of course that proper line placement. Putting that line in place is absolutely critical. Uh, understanding our PPE limitations. This is certainly overlooked, I think, sometimes in some of the recruit training. Uh, it's talked about, but the emphasis really is more on getting dressed appropriately. It's not on what your PPE can and cannot do. Uh, we can't walk on the sun with our gear. Uh, we try to. We think that we can. Uh, it's just not practical. Uh, this coat up here, this is a shot from uh, a near-miss incident we had on April 8, 2011. We, had, we sent five guys to the burn unit as they were exiting the building. Uh, they recognized conditions were changed. We had some communications issue. The line wasn't in place where they were. As they were exiting the building, it flashed, and they couldn't get out the door fast enough. Uh, this is the back of uh, Chucky Ryan's coat. He was the last one out, and uh, you know, he sustained severe burns. He was, what, 43 days in the burn unit? Uh, Chucky has come back to work. Uh, and it, you know, it's a testament, certainly, to uh, the gear we have chosen, the risk assessment we've performed in designing our gear, and uh, the relationships we've had with our manufacturers. Uh, this face piece down here uh, was just uh, it was the shield. The shield itself melted to the mask and started to uh, compromise the lens. Uh, what we don't have a picture of was Chucky Ryan's face piece had actually uh, had melted away as well. Uh, if, when he was coming out, he had cupped his regulator with both of his hands uh, to keep his mask in place because he actually could feel the lens shrinking from around his head. And he was still approximately 10 foot from being outside. When he finally was able to exit, when he doffed his mask, as he disconnected his regulator, since you're the regulator, the lens had melted around the regulator, and he still had his, uh, his webbing and netting around his face. So he was very fortunate. You really can't teach that. Well, I, perhaps you can, uh, but that's more of a, I think it could be an experience thing. It's recognizing what's going on. Uh, you know, our proper fit, this is critical. If your department's not fortunate enough to be able to have two sets of turnout gear, we definitely need to put emphasis on making sure that the manufacturers are coming in and sizing your members. Uh, we used to try to do measurements. Uh, it did not work very well for us. We have now gone towards sizing sets, so we get a better um, idea of coat fit, pants. Uh, we try to stay on top of our guys to say, look, it's, you know, if your gear doesn't fit, you got to come by and tell us. You got to come out there. We got to get new pants for you. We'll buy you a new coat. We'll take care of you. What we don't want is that tight kit, the tight uh, fit walking around, the skinny jeans for PPE pants. We don't want that. We want to be able to have you guys to have that space. Air is probably the best insulator we have, and it doesn't add any weight for us. But when you, you can't even put your arms down like you have inflatable lat syndrome, and you're walking around like this on the fire ground, it's not going to be good for us. When you're afraid to bend down because your pants are going to pop out, or you're stretching at the seams, that's not good. It's not what we want to have on our members. It's also the explanation for our guys, the fit. I mean, our gear, it, it's designed for us to be able to work well together. Should be working against our body. When we're putting those sizing sets on, we actually need to do some stretching, do some yoga, but do some type of movement when you're putting this on. Unfortunately, what I think happens a lot of time is that that feels good. And that's the extent of it. There's, there's no movement. There's no application. Go throw a bottle on. Go grab a tool. Go up and down the stairs. Get an idea. How, see how it fits. We don't really buy shoes that way. Why are we buying, or why are we sizing ourselves for turnout gear, just picking it out? That's good. In reality, it's not. Uh, that's sizing. I mean, it's critical. I can't, can't stress that enough. And it was nice for us to not have to uh, be concerned with that within the department itself. Especially if you have turnover in place, uh, officers are getting promoted, they retire, and all of a sudden your PPE specialist has retired, and now you've lost over 20 years of experience on the job, not having any programs in place or uh, even an information book of sorts to guide the next person in that spot. You can spend years trying to re uh, make that back up. We're also emphasizing in this presentation, you know, we're trying to discuss the modern fire environment. Uh, we're not by all means giving a presentation like uh, Dan or Steve does, but it, we have to call attention to it. You know, we certainly have to train on it on a regular basis. We have to observe it, reading about it. If we're not going to fires, we can certainly go to fires on the computer. 
We can train and drill and watch fires on YouTube. A favorite near us, of course, is Statter 911. If you can avoid the comment section of it, the videos are pretty informative. You know, you can observe those fire conditions that you may not see on a regular basis. If you're not going to fires every day, somebody is, somewhere. Great training tool, great understanding with what's going on with today's fire environment. You know, the, the building materials involved, I mean, we're really dealing with a lot of our new homes. It's sawdust and glue. You know, we can't stay like we thought we could anymore. You know, we have to be able to address it. We're starting to have all that information come out about the change in our tactics uh, to counter uh, years of what we thought was the appropriate way of doing business. Now we need to take that and see how it's going to work for our department. How is it going to affect us based on our staffing, based on our apparatus, based on our city um, or county that we respond in? How, how can we make this work for us? How can we change our SOGs to maximize uh, the safety for our members and actually have a good product or a good, good service delivery for our customers? Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with this, but uh, this was a fire that they had in Riverdale, Maryland. And uh, it's kind of a great, uh, I think it's a great tool just to explain what's going on or even uh, this, the modern fire environment. This initial picture here, uh, not very good. You can't really see where the fire's at. But we do have one of the doors open. You can see a little bit of light smoke down in the little uh, front porch area. A couple of the members are crowding in. Everybody's picking a place right here next to the Ockenspeed to get dressed. Is that really necessarily the best place? Probably not. But over the series of slides, you can see where the fire is now. Doesn't really seem like a lot. Still have some smoke production. The house, I think, was pretty, pretty well charged with smoke. Again, still getting dressed. Still getting dressed, can, can changes, I'm sorry, the conditions have certainly changed. Getting a little bit more severe, certainly have an issue for us. I think we finally have a line stretched, and I believe this had water in it at the time, but the lineman was not ready, was not ready to go at this point. So now we have the rest of the assignment on the scene. You can see the fire conditions they're dealing with now. Anybody have a rough idea what they think the time frame was for this? 120 seconds from the time of the they, they took that first picture to that last picture they saw two minutes this is nice to be able to show uh, our firefighters the veterans the young guys you know getting dressed is, is, is critical it's key where we're dropping our initial line or where we're putting our initial tools down is critical it's, it's key. Maybe this is not the best place to get dressed. Try not to get dressed in front of the door. Off to the side. Stagger yourself. Hey, if I'm getting dressed, I've got this fire going on. If I can't immediately apply water to it, close the door. Reduce that airflow to that occupancy. So 120 seconds. It kind of surprised them. It certainly did. I believe they sent three guys to the burn unit that day. Just they weren't expecting it. So in the end force, our program objectives, what we're looking for is we want to be able to educate firefighters about the lifelong impact of severe burn injuries. Uh, being burned, and I'm sure the guys that have been burned, it's, it's not necessarily a badge of honor that you want. Uh, the, the incident itself, as horrifying as that is, uh, the hospital stay, the recovery, those can all be lifelong impacts uh, on your career, yourself, your family. Uh, it's not an easy thing to come back from. And, and those are the guys that are fortunate enough to be able to come back to work, come back to the job that they love, and, and still continue to do uh, what they do. Um, we want to be able to understand how the firefighter can prevent those burn injuries or how these burn injuries occur. Uh, it's really, it's, it's simple things, it's simple steps that we can take to reduce this. Having our gear cleaned, training on a regular basis, being, being the quickest or the most efficient we are at stretching our lines, throwing our ladders, Paying attention to our SOGs, so we are in place, we are ready to go. Uh, that skin, that skin is important. All these pictures are firefighters, uh, different levels of burn injuries. Uh, for the most severe, hand burns, I think uh, from this slide right here, glove was too tight. Glove was just too tight on the hand, it was trying to get that... Uh, you know, the, maybe he was trying to go for the hands-like leather approach, but he should have had some room even in his glove itself. 
You don't want to have that glove so tight, it's like a leather work glove, like a Wells Lamont work glove. You don't want that tightness on your hand. You've got to have that flexibility, especially if you're the lineman, because where are your hands? They're always out like this. So you're in a compression issue already. You're already drawing that glove tight across the top of your hands. You're going to have a nice thin bit of skin up top, those knuckle areas right there. Extremely uncomfortable. Tight pair of gloves, it's just compounding the issue and making it worse for you. Uh, same thing with everything else. Helmet issue. The last two were uh, Joe Morgan, who was in there. He's featured in our video. But as far as uh, our course content, again, we want to be able to emphasize this, and we can't emphasize it enough. The, the risk associated with firefighting and receiving a burn injury. Uh, it, eventually, it's going to get to a point where by the time our recruits are graduating and our members out on the street, we want to be able to beat this into the head on a regular basis. Not just that our job is inherently dangerous, but why it is. Why your lack of attention to your personal gear is an issue. Why that uh, salty, crusty helmet that's flaking off the paint flakes on, uh, on your New Yorker, why that needs to be maintained. Why that needs to be painted. Why that paint is a level of thermal protection for you. Why that chin strap is a great idea. Because if you're taking heat on the helmet, Imagine how uh, uncomfortable that is without having that helmet in place. Uh, that every time you pick out your turnout gear, if your hands are black and grimy, every time you pick it up, you got to wash it. We have to wash it. With all the carcinogens, the toxins, and everything else we're accumulating on a regular basis anyway, just by the nature of our job, just by the nature of our exposure, we got to clean this stuff up. Having dirty turnout gear is going to increase your chances of taking heat and getting burned. Uh, we, uh, we have a problem at some times where we spend a lot of money potentially uh, cleaning the same set of gear. And I think it's that, well, my second set is, is issued to me that I, don't even, I haven't even taken out of the bag. It's not salty. It's not comfortable for me. I don't want to walk around in the brand new gear because if I have Scotch light that's not melted off and a couple of uh, blackened spots on my gear that you're going to think I'm less of a fireman that I'm not going to make that push or I can't get those ladders up. That's a mentality that we have to be able to squash. We have to get through that. Uh, it, you know, it usually will start with one person just setting the tone and setting the change. Hopefully through education programs like this, we can also push that out there. Uh, this firefighter safety, situational awareness and risk assessment. Uh, lots of stuff going back and forth out on the World Wide Web. Safety is not a bad word. It shouldn't be. Safety for us is training, it's drilling, it's knowing our area, it's knowing our people, it's knowing our capabilities, tools, and equipment. That is going to make you safe. Safety doesn't mean that we, we, we can't do our job with overwhelming aggression, with absolute force and violence when we're putting out these fires and we're, we're responding to these incidents. But by being safe, we're better prepared, we're better trained, we're better educated on what we need to do. Uh, we try to focus on learning from the past, certainly. I mean, that's it's great content, great content there, uh, some of the case studies. You'll, you could read line of duty death reports or near miss incidents like, oh, well, that happened here. Well, that happened here too, but we didn't document it. We didn't submit that as a, a, a near miss. Hey, guys, we should talk about this stuff more. Uh, Katie's going to talk about it when she stands up too, but the importance of receiving proper care and where to seek treatment for the burn injury. Your local hospital is most likely not equipped to be able to appropriately diagnose your level of injury or what your treatment is required. Uh, having a great relationship with that burn unit is phenomenal. Our guys can walk in, they can walk out, receive the appropriate treatment and care that they need, and their injuries are lessened, certainly. We're not looking at skin grafts uh, because they came to see treatment. They didn't get burns infected. Uh, having that uh, ability to understand the treatment and rehab process, it's not fun. It's great when you can walk out of there on your own. It's certainly not fun when you're enduring it, not by any means. Uh, most importantly, I think, at the end of it for us was uh, strengthening and building our partnerships with our local burn unit. Uh, critical. It's critical to be able to know the people that are going to be treating your guys uh, or that you're going to be dealing with who work at that hospital. Establishing those relationships with them, absolutely key. Either through fundraising, through assistance down at the, uh, the burn unit in the hospital, uh, getting to know them both outside of work, absolutely critical. It certainly doesn't make it easier when a member is hurt or injured, but it's, I think it's a reassurance and peace of mind, uh, at least for us, when we know who we can talk to at the burn unit 
we know, uh, you know that they are going to take care of us. They are doing the best that they can, and the best people are certainly on, uh, on the job for us. Uh, and the partnerships moving forward for this, again, we're funded uh, through DHS and FEMA, Fire Prevention and Safety Grants. Uh, we work with a couple of uh, our manufacturers. Uh, Globe specifically was a great help, great help to us. Scott was as well. Um, our fire service partners, as we're expanding it, uh, we were able to work with uh, Boston and FDNY uh, with their strong relationship with their burn, burn units. They brought a lot to the table as well. Uh, they've certainly dealt with uh, a tremendous amount of burn injuries over the years, and it was a wealth of, of experience uh, that we could bring to the table. And uh, certainly some of the larger cities are a great uh, research factory where if it's not occurring in your fire department, it has happened somewhere else. It's just a matter of finding that individual who knows about it, reaching out, and getting a better understanding, glove issues, uh, burn injuries, tactics, uh, trending that they're seeing. If you're not seeing it here, it probably has already occurred somewhere else. Uh, and the burn center partners, we, uh, you know, having those stronger relationships, it'd be nice if every fire department across the country knew who their appropriate burn units were and even knew people in those burn units. Used, knew the employees, knew the staff, the nurses, the doctors. Having that relationship is critical. They may not always be easy if the burn unit is hours away, but if you have a burn unit in your backyard, there's no reason why we don't have a strong relationship with that. Um, you know, we're firemen. We like to drink. We like to party. Firemen and nurses are usually a pretty good combination, but uh, it's, uh, you know, can't, can't stress the advantages of it enough. Um, in closing, for my portion, I mean, you guys, we all know this. I mean, you're, you're setting the example. Uh, you know, we're going to make the difference. Uh, I like to say, at least to the guys that I, that I work with, you know, if, if for us, if doing the right thing was easy, everybody would be doing it. You know, it's so much easier to come into work and just to go along versus trying to stay strong to, to what you believe. Putting your, putting your seatbelt on, uh, cleaning your gear, not walking around with a salty helmet that's bent back and forth, uh, not having the burnout turnout gear, not wearing the SCBA shoulder straps. Uh, we don't have to go in a position this day because it's only a fire alarm, so we don't have to worry about laying out. Staying strong to the job knowledge and doing what is right is certainly going to make the big difference. Makes that break and reduces the chances, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of either you being burned or having a member of your crew burned. Thanks, guys. Forgot my microphone. All right. We're going to have time for uh, questions and answers at the uh, end of the presentation. Next up, we have Katie Holloway. Katie's been a burn nurse for 31 years. Uh, 26 of that, she's been with us at the Burn Center at Washington Hospital Center, where she now serves as the burn outreach coordinator. Spends a lot of time with the fire service in our region and around the country teaching. Uh, Katie is also a member of the Board of Trustees for the American Burn Association. Everyone having fun? Yeah. Frequenting the bars? I would hope. We like to, you know, we like to, to support the local economy. <laughs> um, as Jason and Jan said, um, this is a program that came out of a need that DC um, identified. And it ad ended up coming to the point where we brought together the, the players, basically, and a program was developed basically just for DC. Well, when we saw what it did with DC, we started to look at this more on a national level, and we felt very strongly that, that the departments that we partnered with originally all brought the same kind of factual information to the table, saying they had a number of injuries, too. So we, we thought that this should be promoted into something on a more national level. I think this is a program that will benefit all of you because as you saw Dr. Jordan in the video, you're the crazy ones going into that burning building. So we want to make sure that, that safety is key. And Jan said it several times, and I think this is a very important piece. Training is key. Education is knowledge. We got to have that in order to make sure we can prevent some of this. I'm not saying every burn injury is preventable, but I'm saying that we can do things to definitely enhance this and try to keep you guys safe. Um, I thought they did a great job talking about the program. There's a lot more to it when, when they present it on the fireside. Um, what I did for you guys here at this conference was 
I did not bring the whole medical piece. We do a whole thing where we, we talk about what a burn injury is, things like that, and we talk about the whole point of we take you to the burn center, we fix it, we show you rehab, all that kind of stuff. I left all of that out. I'm going to talk a little bit more with you guys about burn injury, what it is, some of the things you guys can do as first responders to take care of someone who's injured. We'll talk about the different burns. We're going to talk about your safety, <clears throat> things you can do to be safe, and then the whole issue of getting to a burn center. I'm not, every physician is trained on burn care. But if they don't see it on a regular basis, they don't necessarily know how to get you guys that best outcome. Or the public, okay? And people always say to me, why does the criteria change for a firefighter? Bottom line is, criteria changes for a firefighter because it's your career and you're constantly exposed to heat. When we have a burn patient who was cooking and started a kitchen fire and got burned, you know, hopefully we can do a little education with them and say, now don't do this again, but we can't say that to you guys. This is what you do. So it's an awareness thing. We want you guys to be aware of what we can do to help you continue on in your careers and not end these early. So let me ask a couple of questions. Who's got a local burn center close to them? Okay. Okay, you guys, I'm going to go with you other guys who don't have one. Hang on, I'm coming to you. You guys who have one, how many of you know your burn center staff? Wow. All right, there wasn't very many. For those of you that know, that, that have a burn center in your backyard and you don't know them, get in there, say hello, develop a relationship because that's where it starts. You have to develop that relationship and get them on board with who you are, what you do, and what the burn injury means to them. Burn docs know this. Burn teams know this. So go in, somehow figure it out, do a fundraiser for them or something. Throw them, you know, we do uh, guest bartenders. That's always fun. Nurses love to get behind a bar and pretend they know what they're doing. Um, but do something to develop that relationship. Those of you who have the relationship, do everything you can to maintain it. Those of you who have the relationship, do you have a policy in place that says any burn, no matter how big or small, to a firefighter has to be seen at a burn center? Okay? Where are you from? <laughs> That's where it started, Prince George's County, Maryland, and they were the first ones who developed that policy. Okay, okay. I'm not going to have to see you afterwards. I can't quite see you from here. But I think that's imperative, that you get your departments to understand that you guys need to be seen by someone who knows what to do. And, and we have very good hospitals in the surrounding area, but it's that fact that we know what you do and we know what can happen when you guys see fire again too soon. And that's a big deal. We've had firefighters come through our burn center that got injured, were seen somewhere else, went back to work, and then that same burn got worse and now requires a graft. We know when it's ready to go back and see the heat and let you guys move on in your careers. So that's the, that's the biggest piece I'd like to say. For those of you who don't have a burn center in your backyard, where, how far is your local burn center? It was kind of over here. There was a group that didn't have any burn center. Do you have any idea? Where are you from? So, come on. It was over here somewhere. Don't be shy. Okay, so where's your closest burn center? Okay, well that's not so bad, we can handle that. Do something, try to figure out who they are. Get, try to develop that relationship so that you can do that. The other piece is when you do have that big gap in, in geography, you know, telemedicine is becoming more and more and more prevalent. And they use it a lot out here in this area, in the west. It's very different for us in the east. But in the west, you have burn center in Salt Lake City, you have a burn center here in Denver, but you've got like three, three or four states out here that don't have a burn center. So they have great telemedicine. So you guys will end up in a local ED or in your police and fire clinic if you have one like we do in D.C. And then they can always just shoot those pictures off, but there's still that communication piece with the burn professional who will say yay or nay. 
So that's another piece that we have to think about. We're thinking about it on the American Burn Association side is to really develop some, some good technology and get that piece going. And I actually think it will work for us in DC as well because we'll get guys who are out in, in Virginia and you know, there's this big river that runs through the District of Columbia, kind of divides Virginia and Maryland, and they don't like to cross that little moat. So when we don't have to, if we could use some of this telemedicine, it's not a bad idea, because then we wouldn't have to make them drive an hour and a half and rush hour traffic and then send them back home. So it's something to think about, but I would encourage all of you to find out who your burn center is, go meet them, find out who the director is, introduce yourself, you know, maybe tell them what you're looking for and things like that. So let me just start with, with what, how the medical piece in this program goes. And again, we went with some national statistics. I just pulled these last week um, from the NFPA site. So 1.1 million firefighters, 70% volunteer, 30% career. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm just a little old nurse. Firefighter, I always thought, you know, firefighter was a firefighter thought y'all got paid <laughs> when I was a young nurse. And I was actually really surprised to see this. I did not realize that it was so heavy on the, on the volunteer side. And I didn't realize that the fire departments as well were so heavy on the volunteer side. So the point is too, again, we are with the IFF, we are with professional firefighters today, career firefighters, but it is important that we make sure we encompass all firefighters because the injury can be sustained by anyone. Um, obviously, the age distribution is um, less than 50. That's your workforce as well, the majority of your workforce. In 2011, there were approximately 70,000 injuries total to firefighters. And these are what were documented. And here's another piece about the burn injury. Because our burns, 11%, um, they're down 11% from the previous report. They're at 6.2%, and these are national. However, with burns, we don't know what gets reported. We don't know if they're pulling from every little community hospital or if every department is actually reporting everything. So this is another reason we, we firmly believe, we in Burn community believe that this number is higher because when you get us together and we start to network and we start to talk about how many firefighters we see, we're not sure we agree with these particular numbers. We think they're a little low. But it's the point that you guys have a variety of injuries that can be sustained. Um, the infectious disease, I read a whole, a whole article on that. I thought that was, was interesting, something I had never thought about. Um, but again, uh, the numbers are improving a little bit, but as I said, we still think they're out there and need to be addressed. So all of these ways you guys and gals can get burned, um, obviously it's on the way to the job or the fire. It's on the, it's on the fire ground. It could be on the way back to the firehouse. And these are things that, again, I, as a burn nurse, never really thought about. Because I, as a burn nurse and a burn professional, I think of, I see the burn. So I think it's happening at the fire ground. And then we'll have somebody, you know, there was an MVA on the beltway. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that's, again, part of the whole injury that you guys can sustain from the things that you do. I mean, even though there's lights and sirens, how many times are you guys going down the road and somebody's not stopping? Right? So, I mean, that's all that takes. So these are just the, the different occupational hazards that you guys could potentially see. And again, these are where these injuries occur, the fire grounds, and, and up, about half are on the fire ground, which we would, we all thought it was a little bit more, but again, um, it is what the, the latest literature is showing. Um, training, we do see some training injuries. Um, and again, that's just part of what you guys are doing. Um, causes, obviously we're back here to the fire grounds, the non-fire emergencies, this responding to and from, training activities, and then other things while you're on duty. Um, actually had one of our local DC guys, this was a number of years ago, got a um, little issue from a pilot light or on the stove, didn't light, and he bent down to light it, and where was his face when, it went out, when he turned it on? Wake up, where was his face? I, I do an interactive. I can't walk because we don't have a remote. It was like right down there. He's like lighting it. Poof, up it goes. You know, sure enough, we have an inhalation injury that we're dealing with. So things like that can happen as well. Um, fatal injuries, obviously, fire ground was the highest in non-fire emergencies. Um, returning to and from, 
and then your training accidents. Okay, so that was just some of the background, the, the data that we took from NFPA, just showing that the injuries are out there. You guys do get injured, and, and some of them are burns, and we want to make sure that we can continue to see that number come down. So the burn part of this program is, like I said earlier, we talk a little bit about burn injuries, what it is. What we can do as well is, how many of you guys, so you're all EMTs, right? Yes? Everybody firefighter EMT? Any paramedics in the room? Okay. Um, how many of you guys always have a paramedic who shows up at the scene? Okay. There's a number of you guys that did not raise your hand, and, and you could get left trying to figure out how to take care of your buddy. So we talk about some of the first, some of the things that you guys can do at the scene. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the, the depth of burn and things like that. Um, we'll talk about, I'm going to explain who needs care, which one, firefighter, who needs care? Who needs burn care? Come on. Everyone, thank you. Okay. Um, and then we talk about the phases of treatment and recovery, but like I said, due to time constraints for this particular program today, I left that piece out. So the first thing we have to talk about, and, and it's the skin structure. It's what, what does the skin do for us? Protects us, okay? So if you don't have it, it's a problem, okay? So you want to make sure that you understand what the skin is, what the levels of burn are, and what they do to that skin, and then what can come from that. So the outer layer of our skin is the epidermis. You see it every, you go in the shower, you wash, you flake off cells, new ones are constantly growing from underneath. Your dermis, this is what I call the heart of the skin or the meat of the skin, it's where everything is. Hair follicles, blood vessels, sweat glands are all in that dermal layer. And then the subcutaneous tissue or the fat layer. Now, if you look at it in a picture, on that top layer is your epidermis and then your dermis is down there, it's a bigger, thicker layer. And then your subcute tissue, some have more, like me, and others have less. Okay, so depth of burn, who knows these? All right, you're going to help me. First degree, what is it? Sunburn? Surfs of the what? Yeah, it's an epidermal, epidermal burn, okay? Most common cause is sunburn. Does it need to be treated at a burn center? Not necessarily, and I got a lot of head shaking, no. You're listening. I like that. It does. It depends on the body surface area. How many of you guys have gotten a sunburn? Okay. On the part of the body that got burned got from the sun, did you get a little swollen? It was a little tight? Okay. That's the fluid shift, and that's what happens in a burn injury. You have fluid in your blood vessels. That's what we need to maintain perfusion, to maintain cardiac output, to make our heart work, all that kind of stuff. If you don't have that, you get hypovolemic and you die. So that's what happens in the area where you get burned. So imagine a sunburn to a large percentage of the body. Who's gotten a big burn, sunburn? You know, big, a lot of areas. Did you feel horrible after it happened? How come? Because it hurt. Why else? It's the shift of fluid, okay? And you just feel horrible. How did you fix it? Okay, so you get burned, you're at the beach, you're with your buddies, are you comfortable or uncomfortable? You're uncomfortable, right? It hurts. How do you fix that? Stay out of the sun. Ella, come on, you guys, you're firefighters. I'm getting disappointed here. How do you fix it? Thank you. Drink more beer, <laughs> right? You got the issue with the pain. Right? So you're going to have your cocktail, take care of your pain, but what are you doing to the whole hypovolemic issue? Making it worse. So what should you be having after each beer? Yeah, have a little bottle of water. And I always get this question, well, can I have a, can I have a cocktail, mixed, mixed drink? I'm like, eh, sure, but that's not going to count as your water. So you want to make sure you rehydrate, and that's one of the biggest things, and that's why you feel bad, because you had this shift of fluid, and you, you know, just feel horrible. All right, second degree is when the epidermis is going to have a blister or it's actually started to peel away. So let me ask this question to all of the firefighters in the room. 
Who has gotten a blister from working? Okay. Where, where were you treated? Were you treated? Let me ask you that. Were you treated? Uh, Self-treated. Self there you go. What about you? <laughs> okay. Um, did anybody go to the burn center? Call the burn center? Go to a local ED? No. Okay. Did you go back to work? Sure you did. Sure you did. When was the last time you saw fire? A couple weeks. Okay, so you had a little bit of time in there. What about you? Okay. What happens if you had that blister and you got back to the firehouse and the bell went off again and you had a fully engulfed building and you were the, I always get this wrong, you were the nozzle man, right? You were the guy on the lead. What about that? What could have happened? Any idea? Yeah. Could have gone a lot worse. And this is, these are what, this is what we want to try to prevent. We want to try to help you guys stay safe and make sure that you get this injury cared for appropriately because these can be career ending. I mean, even though it was a little blister and doesn't sound like a big deal, it can evolve into bigger, bigger things and make things worse. So I want you guys to think about this. I want you to take this back and talk about it and go to your local burn centers and have these discussions because these can be, these can put, if they're not career ending, they could still put you out of work for, six weeks, eight weeks. But sometimes if we can get you into a burn center and we get it taken care of, you're not going to be out that long, all right? So the cost of the department per se isn't as bad as a two-month period off. I will tell you that burned ears, how many of you guys have had red ears? <laughs> okay, burned ears. Sometimes they will hold our guys out longer than a burn on the forearm because the ears are so tenuous, that skin on the, on the ear is so, so thin, that if that ear sees any kind of heat again, you could end up with burned cartilage. And if you have burned cartilage, what happens? Poof, okay? Poof mean what? It, you're not, your whole ear swells up, and then what happens? It's dead. Burned cartilage is not going to come back. So then you're ending up with no ears. So I want you to think about some very simple steps and things that you have all done which we know, and, and, and the ways that you guys can make sure you stay safe. So these first and second degree burns are really, really something to think about and to make sure you get looked at, okay, so that you don't end up back in a hot fire and make this injury worse. Your third and your fourth degree, third degree is a burn to the fat layer, um, fourth degree is down to muscle or bone. These are ones that you're going to have to be seen for, period, no matter what. Um, this is dead tissue. It's not going to heal. It needs to be grafted in order to be fixed. So it's more of these first and second degree burns that I want you guys to think about and think about what you do as a career and how, what, what you need to do to make sure you guys and your department stay safe. So the terminology we use in the medical field is partial, and, uh, partial thickness and full thickness. Doesn't really make a difference what terminology you talk in. Um, it's all the same, but your partial thickness is first or second degree. Um, what do these look like? Don't read the slides. Pardon me? Bad sunburns. So you can have blisters with this one. It's usually pink or red. But the biggest key to making the determination that it's a partial thickness injury is what? Any idea? Pain? What else? Blistering? Anything else? Think of anything else? Big, one of the biggest things for you guys at the scene, if you've got a victim or if you've got a buddy who gets burned, wet and weepy, really slimy, that's your partial thickness burn. And when you touch him, what's the patient, what is your buddy going to do? Ow, how come? Right, because the nerve ending is exposed. <coughs> and I think that's one of the biggest things, too, about burn injury and what we do and what you do. For you guys at the scene and, a, and with a burn injury, you got to do what you got to do, and that's one thing I want you all to remember. You need to do what you need to do. If this is someone in your department, they get caught like they did in D.C. With they, when they had this incident in April of 11, whenever that was, a lot of focus went into, we don't want to do that because we're going to hurt them and make it worse. You need to, you, we need to change that mentality. You got to do what you got to do. You got to do what's right, okay? We know that this hurts. 
but we have to do what's right at the scene. Something that gets done improperly at the scene can actually make things worse. So touching them and moving them, partial thickness, it's going to hurt. You've got to do it, okay? One of the questions that came up from that incident in D.C. was when Chuck Ryan came out, apparently there was a big issue, or there, not a big issue, there was some discussion about his gear and taking his gear off. Take it off or not take it off. What do you guys think? He's screaming, right? You've got to take it off. Okay, it's going to continue to burn. So yes, it's your buddy. Yes, it's your brother. We all understand that, but we have to do what's right at the scene. And these partial thickness burns do hurt, and that is part of the whole issue. It's, it's, it lands on all of us too, who provide burn care. It's a hard thing to do, to listen to someone scream, but we know what's at the end of that road, and that's what we look for. So the partial thickness is, is that wet and weepy. Full thickness, what's it going to look like? Leathery, that's a big, a big one. Now, here you go. I got one for you here. Now you got a victim. You're pulling him out of the house. You can tell it's a full thickness burn. You see it's dry and leathery, but the patient is screaming. So how come, are, how come they're screaming? The surrounding tissue can be, can be partial thickness. Plus, my thing is, I always think they scream because they, they think they're supposed to. So even sometimes when it doesn't hurt, oh, I have a burn, I'm supposed to scream and yell. Or it's, you know, I've had this traumatic issue just happen to me, so I have to scream and cry. But it is true, the, part, the full thickness doesn't hurt. It's gone all the way through that dermal layer, and the nerve endings are now gone. Now, let me go back to firefighters and full thickness, partial thickness, depth of burn. A full thickness burn and a firefighter. What have you lost that you have to have? Not well, besides the skin, keep going. Bingo. You have to have sweat glands in, in order to auto-regulate your temperature. If you don't have those, we can't throw you back in gear and let you go back into a house and overheat. And that was the problem with Joe Morgan from DC Fire. He was one of the, he, that issue, that incident had four um, firefighters burned. One died right away. And then one died within like 48 hours. And then I, once I had the, the gentleman who passed away, I moved over and took care of Joe. And he survived. He did great. You know, it was wonderful to see the outcome. But the bottom line was he was a 70% burn. There's 70% of his body that doesn't have the ability to sweat. So putting him back into gear and throwing him in a, in a hot environment was not something that was possible. Now I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to throw you two under the bus here. Do you sweat where you've been grafted? Where you've been grafted, the, those sweat glands are gone. So it's truly that issue that becomes a big deal. So the bigger percentage of the burn that's grafted, that's going to impede how you end up returning to work as well. Um, okay, so we'll just this quick, this your sunburn. I always laugh at this one. What's the prevention method here? Yeah, a little sunscreen might help. All right, now, here is your partial thickness. It's wet and it's weepy. This isn't the best projector, but um, if we had a good one, you could see how slimy this particular injury is. Um, this is a firefighter, so tell me how this one happened. Air pack. Uh -huh. And as Jan talked about, one of the biggest things I think you guys need to think about is your gear and making sure it fits properly. Um, this is an issue that we see occasionally is that, is that air pack. Now, this is... The picture on the left is a firefighter, and again, not the best projector, so it doesn't really show it, but it's blisters. So I told you in the beginning when I got up here that I was going to talk to you a little bit about things you could do at the scene. So what do you think you do with this? Your buddy comes up to you, he takes his glove off, and he says, oh, man, look what happened. Separate his fingers, okay. How come? Okay, okay. Dry sterile dressings, that's always a big one. Watch, big one. Watches and rings, go ahead and get those off. Let me go back to the dry sterile dressing. How many of you guys have been taught to put dry sterile dressings on burns? <laughs> okay. And again, this is where it gets... Okay. 
Okay, where are you from? Okay, and, that, and that's good. You have a nice protocol on that one, and it is true. And it depends where you practice. So like in DC, one of the things I'm, I'm like, forget the dressing. First off, sterile. Is the burn wound sterile? No. So it's kind of like whatever. So I always tell the guys, don't bother with all this sterility thing and trying to be gentle and wrap it up. Throw a sheet over it or a pillowcase or a towel or nothing and ship them. But when we get out to these other areas, Florida, um, areas out here out west, those would probably require a little bit of wrapping. Doesn't have to be, you know, anything big. The sterility piece I laugh at, that's what you're going to have on the ambulances. That's fine. But you can go ahead and, and wrap that. Now, this is where blisters, and it depends on who the practitioner is, there's a couple of different views. One is leave them alone. One is drain them. Um, so if you, whatever you can do for transport, do what you can to try to keep the blister intact to let that medical professional make the decision on how they want to treat it. Our preferred method is to go ahead and drain it and get rid of that um, fluid, and then the epidermis is dead, but it sits back down, and it's the patient's own biological covering. And then as the new cells grow up from underneath, it spits it off like a scab, so it's like fixed in a week. But it, it's, again, very practitioner-based on that. So here's your full thickness. Remember how we talked? Yes. And this, and he brought up a good point, he asked about the infection piece. And this is, a, it's a, everyone thinks burns an infection, right? Okay. Little burns, if they got infected, would it be okay? The burn's probably going to be fine anyway, no matter what. Something small. But when you get into big burns, they're going to get infected. We can't, we can do everything we can can in the world to prevent it, and it doesn't work. Big burns are going to get infected, have to be treated with antibiotic therapy. So as far as like a, a hand and, and doing something, I, as, as far as a hand and you guys as first responders, I wouldn't do anything to that. I would let the hospital make that decision, um, and then they'll go from there. Um, but uh, yeah, there's that whole thought process. If you open it, it's going to get infected, but big burns get infected. So it's just one of those things. All right, so here's your full thickness. And again, as the gentleman said, the edges, do you see the edges, how they're pink? Okay, so those are your partial thickness. You have that full thickness burn right in the center. Is that going to heal? No, that needs to be grafted in order to be fixed. Here's your fourth degree, muscle and bone. Are these alive or dead? Dead, okay. Picture on the left, how do we fix it? Correct, this is where amputations come into play is when you get these big burns. How do, how do most patients or people get this type of injury? I'm sorry, what? Unconscious in fires, one, that was the, the particular patient on the right, was a, a pure flame burn. But what else? What about, um, yeah, it's your big electricals, your linemen. Okay, so scald, and again, the firefighter, here's a problem, and this all goes back to gear. All right, you've got the, the steam comes right up through the sleeve, okay, of your coat. The, now, Jan talked about um, kneeling. Avoidable or unavoidable for a burn? I'm always not sure. You know, you guys, you, you practice on your knees. You fight fires on your knees. So that, I think, is something that, you know, you have to think about, and it's one of the problems that we can run into. Picture on the left, how did it happen? Yeah, no, no, Max. Now, I started practicing many, many years ago. And if there's anyone out there that's been practicing many, many years ago, this was a common problem because there were no no Max hoods. <laughs> so we saw this all the time when I practiced in Chicago. Picture on the right, again, is the scalp. What do you guys need to wear? What did Steve Halliday say in the video? You got to wear that chin strap. You got you to gotta put it on. Um, all right, inhalation, this is always an issue. We need to make sure that, that we always check into this and treat it as need be. Um, your, and then here's your hot objects. And I thought this one was interesting, the picture on the top. Do you have any idea what this is and how it occurred? What part of the body is it? Okay, the neck. 
So how do you think it happened? Embers. Okay, happened during overhaul. So if it happened in overhaul, what did he not have on? A helmet. Okay. So think about that. And again, you guys are all taught to do things, and, and you need to think about how these injuries occur and what you can do to prevent them. Jan talked about fit. He did a lot of that. This picture on the bottom right, this is actually a waist. We had a firefighter whose coat was way too small. He, leaned, he reached out with the hose, coat came up, and it caught him. So things like this can happen, and I think that goes back to the appropriate fit of your gear. Chemical burns, these are things that can occur as well. These are really, really deep burns. Um, the chemical will continue to burn. As far as treating a chemical, for you guys as first responders, what do you do? Flush with water, okay? All right, and electrical burns, this I, oh, this I thought was so interesting until I actually had this firefighter. Here's my friend from PG. This was a PG firefighter, and this happened in overhaul as well. And, and there were a lot of things that myself as a burn nurse, I didn't understand about firefighting until we got to actually go down to the academy and spend a day. And so we got to play firefighter. And when they took us in the entanglement building, I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and then they're like, come on, come on. And I'm like, you know, you got all that stuff on and you're trying to figure out how to go. And I was like, what in the hell have you all done to us? And then it was then in that building I realized the other hazards for you guys. And we actually had a firefighter who got caught with a um, live wire right on his arm, um, burned right through his turnout gear. So things like this can happen. You guys do a hazardous job. So it's awareness and making sure all of these things fit um, and that you, know, you get that right outcome. So the bottom line is here's the, here's the referral criteria for the American Burn Association and who should be referred to a burn center. But the bottom line is for you guys as firefighters, we talked about this earlier, we need to see all of you so that we can ensure that that burn doesn't get any worse and that you can go on and practice in a safe situation so this doesn't happen to you. So I would encourage each and every one of you to go back to your jurisdictions, make that connection with your burn center, those of you who are too far, figure out who they are, somehow try to make some contact, see if there's some telemedicine out there that you can work with in order to ensure that you guys stay safe. So that's my portion. I hope you guys kind of understood it. There's actually more to it in the full program that talks about the actual care and rehab piece. Thank you, Katie. Um, we got some time for uh, questions and answers. First thing, we need everybody in here to fill out your evaluations. And let me give you the code on this. If you liked it, please let us know. If you didn't, all three of our names is Jan Sipes. So just write that one down. <laughs> it's going to be HS04D. Again, HS04D. So fill those out. We want to, uh, if you liked it, we want to know. If you didn't like it, tell us why. We want to know. Um, again, this wasn't the whole program that we teach. This is only a part of it. Uh, the program that we do teach, one of the reasons that we came up with national sponsors and partners on the program is we don't teach any tactics in the program on the firefighter side. We understand that even just in the Washington metropolitan area, um, tactics vary greatly. So. We wanted just to put together a program to keep our guys safe, to keep you guys safe. So here's contact information for all three of us. Does anybody in here have any questions or comments? Yeah, we're actually getting ready to, we're in the process of redoing that website. It's it happens in seconds or it happened in seconds.org. Um, and if you're interested in a program coming to your city or anything like that, let us know um, or email one of us and we will start to make arrangements for that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. We 
we do in DC. Um, we spec all of our gear out there. We have a great relationship with Globe, who makes our gear. The same with PBI, who does the fabric. Um, we are actually the only department in the country that deals directly with Globe. We don't have a vendor that we go through, and our history with them goes back prior to World War II. So um, I was more active in the safety committee a couple, ago, or a couple of years ago uh, when I had more time, but uh, during that time, I know that working with Globe, if we had issues with our gear, we would call them up. It was never a them saying, hey, this is what you spec'd out, this is what you bought, it's on you. It was always, what do we need to do to fix this problem? So we do look at our gear specs about every three years and uh, try to make adjustments and changes with that. Okay, the, uh, one of the issues we had with 48th place uh, with the gear itself, every time we've had any type of a serious injury like that, there's always a rush to, well, the gear is bad. It's, it's, it's terrible. It's a manufacturer's issue. It's, it's always something. And, uh, you know, a lot of the spec and where we, where we are today has, has been trial and error, I think, over the last 25 plus years. Uh, to finally have a system that works for us, we have a good balance uh, between our uh, TPP and our THL. Uh, the, the members are happy with the fit and comfort. That's always key. If something's not comfortable, uh, I don't care how you try to sell it, but the, the guys aren't going to buy into it. So uh, us being able to provide the input uh, in designing the gear and uh, one of the, uh, that picture from Chucky Ryan when Pat Freeman came out to examine the gear, uh, Globe sends her out just to, uh, to, to examine it, to check it, to try it out. Uh, one of her first words out of her mouth was, oh my God. Uh, she had seen less, uh, of more of, she had, in her time, I guess 30 plus years with Globe, uh, she has seen gear that has been less damaged than was firefighter fatalities. So uh, for whatever reason, uh, that day, uh, Chucky Ryan was able to take a tremendous amount of heat. Uh, the gear protected him, it did its job. Uh, and you know he survived as a result. So we're, we're very fortunate for that. Uh, but it really it, it ends up being a trial and error process to, to be able to make sure you have everything lined up like you need it to be. One of the other things with the gear is um, when we did the investigation committee, which started back in 2007, that year we were averaging, and we thought it was okay, we were averaging about 20 burns a year of guys going to the burn unit. And that year it spiked to about 27 guys. Now in 2007 we had a fire on 4th Street Northeast where we had four guys end up in the burn unit in day when a room flashed on them. Um, in that particular fire, the guy with the most extensive burns, he was about 38%, spent about two months in the burn unit. Um, his gear, he could have went back to work with. There was, when we took his gear and tore it apart for the investigation, there was minimal damage to it. The two guys who walked out of the burn center the next day who had minor burns, their gear was completely destroyed. Um, one of the things that we learned in doing our investigations and our burn committee in D.C. was guys didn't know anything about their gear. Um, being on the safety committee, I would get heat from the guys in the firehouse about, you know, this PBI gear you're buying is junk. Well, why is it junk? Well, we're burning more guys. Or um, this globe stuff is terrible. Well, they didn't know anything about the gear. They just thought the gear was supposed to protect them no matter what. They knew nothing about People thought that PBI was the company who made the gear, designed the gear, and everything else. They didn't know it was a fabric. They thought Globe was a fabric, so it's, it's firemen not knowing anything about PPE. That was one of the biggest things that we recognized. In our program, we spend about 10 minutes talking about PPE, talking about sizing, how it's made, how it's designed, what it's supposed to do, what it's not supposed to do. One of the other things we were finding with our hand burns was um, we had complained for a long time to the department that the gloves that we had had no dexterity in them. And the risk management chief who kept buying the gloves wanted gloves with extreme thermal protection in them. Well, the downside of having a lot of thermal protection was there was no dexterity in them. And um, guys weren't wearing them. We had guys wearing leather gardening gloves on house fires and getting their hands burned. So that stuff started to come out a lot more when guys were realizing, hey, we have some input, we're getting injured, this is why we didn't wear the gear. So we did some glove testing. Um, the department now, we have gloves that guys feel comfortable with, that gloves or gloves that guys like to wear, and our hand burns have went down big time. Any other questions? We had, uh, on one of our in-service training days, we would do the flashover simulator. 
And I had a guy show up to me right before we were going in, and it was like, hey, uh, Sarge, he's like, I can't do this today. He was head to toe in Under Armour. And, and it wasn't the uh, Under Armour charge, so it wasn't 100% cotton. You know, he was wearing the, uh, the wrong thing, essentially, for our job. And I was like, well, I mean, we've been pushing this stuff out on a regular basis. I mean, trying to give you better advice as far as what's wear underneath. Uh, we are in an FR uniform. Uh, we'd like to be able to move a little bit farther forward to that and maybe look at either 100% cotton uniforms or maybe even step up to Nomex uh, just for that comfort of the members. I mean, D.C. was built on a swamp, so the summers there are terrible, uh, and especially uh, when you put on the fireman costume and uh, sweat around, it, it, it's not good. But uh, what we're starting to see, I think, is the charged cotton shirts. It's, it's not only uh, the comfort and the, the presence of mind. It feels good, but it dries a heck of a lot quicker which from run to run will make a big difference for you in the long run, too. Okay, first gentleman in the back here in the uh, orange shirt. I think that's part of the thing too. When we made these um, policies with the local departments, um, there is no light duty. And we made that stipulation in every policy that went out. So Prince George's County was the first one to have it. Montgomery County has one. Um, Fairfax, Fairfax City, Loudoun, and that, that's one of the biggest things. And, and our concern with that is if you have an ear burn and they put you back to answering phones, hello, that's just stupid. If you have sylvanine all over your hands, do you want to be answering a phone? So the, the, the thought process with us is, you know, no. And then we did have this big discussion about, well, can't they just go back and drive the fire truck? And then it was our director who stood up and said, they're firemen. You're going to let them drive a fire truck? You know damn well they're going to run in that building. So that's, we made that policy. It's in every one of um, the policies that we've come up with is that we at the Burn Center are the only ones that can return you to work, and we do stay away from light duty. So that's, you know, it's, it's not good to be answering a telephone. Right. Yeah. Okay. It, well... And, and I'll throw this one out there. How many of you guys have sylvanine in your medicine chest at home? <laughs> okay. Um, it, 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 it is still the, the, the main product for burns. Um, it's pretty much for the big burns. There's, over the past several years, there's just so many new products that have come out that work a little bit better for some of the smaller stuff and for someone who understands. Um, you know, you can give them some direction and tell them what to do. So there are some different things that are out there now that heal just as well. Um, and have the antimicrobial coverage as well. Gentleman up front here. I think was that. One of the things we talk about in our program is I hope most guys when you go to work in the morning, the first thing I do is check my mask, make sure my mask is working, bottle's working. We also talk to the guys about checking the gear. I mean, it's your gear. It's, you're wearing it. Nobody else is wearing it. It's your responsibility to make sure the stuff that you're wearing is protecting you and you're going home. Um, 
we have a gear cleaning policy and inspection in place in D.C. when we have money. Um, we have a lot of money now. Our chief's just not spending it. So, but the problem with that is, and I think Jan talked about this, is guys are sending in their same set of gear to get cleaned every time, and it's a set they don't wear. So when the gear would go out and it gets inspected or cleaned, they also do an inspection on it. Um, but, I mean, we teach guys you need to look at your own stuff and take care of yourself. So um, the department's not always on your side. One more uh, question over here or comment? Yes, sir. I agree, and we had these policies put in place back in 2007. Prior to that, we have a police and fire clinic in D.C., which is about like a cat vet. I mean, they're terrible. Um, none of them have any occupational health backgrounds for the most part. Our guys were going in there for ear burns, and um, it was three weeks before they get referred to the burn center. By that time, the ear's infected. They're having more problems. The burn docs came to me and said, look, we can have your guys back to work quicker than they're coming to see us. We had some chiefs on the job at the time who understood that, and they were out for the guys. And um, in 2007, we started seeing this spike. And this was a couple years after all burns went to the burn center. Now we have a zero tolerance policy. If you've got a blister on your ear, your wrist, anything, you go to the hospital. If you don't, not only can you get disciplinary action, your officer can. You're not going to get in trouble for why you got burned, but we're just trying to make sure all of our guys get treated. Uh, from the union standpoint, we don't want to see guys not getting taken care of the way they should. And a lot of departments nowadays, I know especially with ours, they're looking for reasons not to have to pay. So waiting that next day or a couple of days is not a good answer. All right, thank you very much. Uh, again, any other questions, come up and see us. Or if you got, uh, want to shoot us an email, do that as well. Thank you.